Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Hey guys, I'm back, back in the garage. Man, it's kind of it's muggy in here today. Um, if you're not seeing this, it's because with this unreliable computer, the video didn't come out. And if you're watching this, I guess it came out. Um, if there's glitches uh, or the computer screen freezes, um, I'll probably post this up anyway because um, there's no guarantees that if I redid it, it would come out okay anyway. Um, got a few things going on that have caused me to be very low energy lately, and I've been constantly thinking of making videos and what subject to uh, make them about. Whenever I think of, of doing a video, I end up kind of, you know, coming up with the theme for the video, and I notice that I end up wanting to pull a lot of the same albums that I've shown in the past, and I never get around to showing albums that I haven't shown before, um, which is a little strange. So, today I'm only going to show four four albums and um, therefore I thought I could keep my talking about each one down to a minimum of about an hour to an hour and a half each so this video shouldn't run much past six hours in total um, I, I thought I don't know why but I always have to have a theme and because I bought a, a recent um, album that fits into this theme I thought I would do a theme video. Uh, I have three CDs and one vinyl album. And what the theme is, I don't buy a lot of these. Um, but they're live festival albums, you know, recorded at various live uh, festivals. But um, ones that only contain various artists. In other words, not, uh, not just a live album by a specific group, but rather... Um, albums that feature all different musicians, sometimes from different um, festivals over the years. I don't necessarily buy a lot of these. The reason that I buy them is generally, generally, there's one artist uh, uh, that, um, you know, on one of these albums that a lot of times they only have one track that it, I'm a big fan of, and of course it's nothing that's available somewhere else, that, that live track. So I end up buying the festival album, and you know, get sometimes get introduced to new artists or get to listen to artists that I know a little bit about, but not a lot. Um, and I, I thought I would show one of these is a new acquisition, and a couple of these are old favorites. I may have shown this. I only have one vinyl, and the reason I don't have this on CD is because this is one of the ones that has never come out on CD. And this is a Polydor in America album. You know, and I'm trying to remember. I'm not even sure if this is up on Discogs. Uh, the New Jazz Festival, Hamburg, 1975. So this is an oldie. And this is funny because I remember the day that I found this. I didn't know this record existed. And I was actually in a good old-fashioned record store. This would have been about 1980. 81, 82, somewhere in there, and flipping through probably the miscellaneous, uh, miscellaneous jazz, and I came across this, which amazed me that I didn't know of its existence prior to this, because it's um, four different groups, four songs, so there's one song for each group, and it's basically all ECM-related artists, and live performances that are not anywhere else, you know, not not reproduced anywhere else in any other recordings. I try to remember, I'm not sure if this one is on Discogs or not. Um, so when I saw this, I was just amazed because it had some of my favorite musicians and I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of it. It's, um, so it's from 70, the, the concert recordings were all from 1975, uh, this festival going on, and it, apparently, um, it's physical, different physical locations, but I guess there's a jazz festival that runs um, for a few days in June, and or did, 
and at various um, places around Hamburg, Germany. And um, it's got the Tom Thomas Stanko unit, the trumpeter, a very interesting trio, which is trumpets, electric piano, and drums. Uh, Dave Liebman's Lookout Farm. And if you remember, Lookout Farm was one of the early ECM recordings. So for a while, Dave Liebman, who didn't do a lot of recordings uh, for ECM, he was an ECM recording artist uh, briefly. And I guess during, and I, and I guess that Lookout Farm album must have come out around this time. So uh, David Liebman on saxophones and the great. Uh, Richie Byrock on piano, who played wonderfully with John Abercrombie's quartet for a, a handful of years. Um, Vidal Roy on percussion, who played with Miles Davis and a whole other bunch of people. Uh, bass player and a drummer, neither one of which I'm familiar with. Um, so there's that track, which is quite interesting. Uh, Terji Richtel's Odyssey, which was a you know band that Terji had. Uh, well, in this, let me see, there's only five people in this, but I think it was a larger band on the recording, if I remember the original studio recording. Must have been six players, maybe. Um, but so it's got uh, a, live a live version of Rolling Stone uh, track from the Odyssey album. Uh, this one only runs ten and a half minutes, and I know the original track was like a 20-minute track, and it fades out, so I'm sure they probably played a lot longer, but you're talking about the limitations of vinyl and I think this whole thing is runs about like 42 43 minutes somewhere like somewhere around there and of course Eberhard Weber's colors which is you know that's the one that really lit the light bulb for me when I saw that there was a, a live track um, and uh, a song that had not been recorded in the studio even by Eberhard Weber's colors I just couldn't grab it fast enough so it's got the great Charlie Mariano on reeds, John Christensen on drums, my favorite drummer, and uh, Rainier Burninghouse on piano. So this would have been around the time of Yellow Fields because John Christensen was only the drummer for Eberhard Weber's Colors uh, on that Yellow Fields album, which uh, I guess was I guess I was doing this from memory. It must have been 1975. I'm pretty sure it was. So they did a short tour, I guess, and and this track called Appalachian was not uh, something that was ever recorded on the studio album by the band. Um, the recording quality is not bad, but, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm not actually a fan of, of, of live recordings when it comes to, to, to jazz or classical music um, as much, unless it's very electric, unless like all the instruments are electric. Um, most of these albums... I believe we're recording uh, outside at open air festivals, so they're not necessarily um, clubs or enclosed places. And one thing that an open air festival is infamous for, and it's having horrible sound, um, it tends to be very boomy in the bass and not clear and all that. And it's just the nature, especially the, the more acoustic instruments you use, the more you rely on the microphones to pick that up. And you got the wind blowing into the microphones, and you know the, the microphones might uh, favor the, the, the treble end of an instrument's range or the bass end of an instrument's range. And especially with an uh, upright acoustic bass uh, outside in a live festival setting, it tends to sound rather boomy and not, not clear and clean. And uh, the more acoustic instruments you have, like acoustic pianos and saxophones, the harder it is to record and get a good sound. Elec electric instruments are more forgiving because you're not you don't necessarily have to uh, put the microphone in front of an amplifier. You can plug an electric guitar or keyboard basically directly into uh, the soundboard and a PA, and it comes out. You know, what they play is what you hear, and none of that worrying about microphones picking up the audio. Um, but for acoustic instruments, I'm generally not a big fan of, especially outdoor festivals, though. You know, there's a lot of albums out there by artists, and I have a lot of them, that are live performances and especially in the jazz world they're a lot different live um, sometimes 
for the sake of brevity or whatever is going on in the studio, uh, the tracks on the studio album will maintain a certain length and they maybe not go over that length in terms of how long the tracks are, but when they go out live, they just improvise on them and extend them sometimes two or three times longer than the original studio track. So the live versions are very different than the studio versions, which is why, you know, if you're a fan of... Uh, any jazz artist really you're gonna even if you don't like live albums you're gonna want to pick up live albums because these tracks are so different live in a lot of cases um, and and there's just a, a few you know and plus a lot of these you know it's not a pop band so it's not uh, you know, most of these jazz bands are not a band that's running through their greatest hits and doing you know as close to the studio recording representation of the track live. They're playing uh, new compositions or, you know, or, or different covers and things that they didn't even put on their studio albums. If they're doing tracks from their studio albums, they're extending them in a lot of cases or changing the arrangement and the solos and uh, you know have a different musicians uh, supporting the band, you know, that than the musicians that played on the original recording, and all those factors make them different from the originals. So you really can't ignore live albums when you're when you're in the in the jazz world. Um, another one that I love, 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 is the IAI Festival, the uh, Independent uh, Artists Alliance um, label that Paul Blay had in the 70s, in the mid-70s, I guess it was. For just a few years, he owned his own label that was based out of New York, and he signed a bunch of musicians to record albums on them, and I think most of the albums are out of print now because Paul Blay gave up the label shortly after, he, I think it was only around for five or six years. He signed a bunch of artists, uh, made a bunch of very interesting and some very experimental avant-garde albums. And one of the last things they did is this little mini IAI festival of just their artists. And they came out with a, this, this is one of the last things they released on the label. Um, and it, the print is so small, I, I can't read it now because I'm going blind. Uh, I, I forget, 70-something. I want to say it might be 70... I can't read. I can't, you know, it's like I need magna. I'm, I'm getting old. I need magnifying glasses. I have to do everything by memory. I want to say this might have been 1978. Um, the thing that made me pick this up, and a lot of the other IAA recordings initially, was my love of Bill Connors, especially at this time because Bill Connors had dropped the electric guitar entirely and was just playing the acoustic guitars at this point, acoustic and uh, nylon string and steel string acoustic guitars. And he has a track on here, a very long track, it's about 11 minutes long, that's just him on a, on a g acoustic guitar with uh, Jimmy Guffrey, I think it is, on, on clarinet. It's called Spanish Steps. So it's just him and Guffrey. You know, again, the print is so small on this, I can't read it. Is it Guffrey or Lee Konitz? I think it's Jimmy Guffrey. I can't read I got the thing right in front of me, and the, the print is so small, I can't read it. Um, so it's just clarinet and guitar, which is an interesting combination. This little, like, 11-minute piece. And it's the only piece that Bill plays on, but it's worth the price of the whole album. Uh, Paul Blay does play piano on one piece. And the only other two musicians that appear on it are Jimmy Guffrey, playing clarinet and saxophone, and Lee Konitz playing saxophone and uh, flute, I believe. I have to do this from memory because, the, again, the print is so damn small on the CD. You know, and there was space for them to increase it. They just reproduced the original LP, and the size of everything shrunk down, and yet they leave all this blank space, and they really need to expand the lettering so you can read it without a magnifying glass. Um, but it's only these four musicians... Paul Blade does a long track in, in, a, in a duet with, with saxophone. Uh, Bill Connors plays a piece, as I mentioned. And I love this album. It's all of like 36 minutes long. And um, then you have the two horn players, Jimmy Guffrey and Lee Konitz. And they do three very short, but I, I love them, uh, three very short horn duets, just the two of them playing horns. 
uh, different combinations of horns, clarinet and saxophone, clarinet and flute. And they do three short pieces, so there's no rhythm section, there's no piano or anything supporting them. It's just the two horns. And I absolutely love it. And that's one of the things that you always hope you'll come across. You know, I bought this for the Bill Connors track, even though I, I like the, the three other musicians involved on the album. Uh, but you always hope that there's other little gems in there. And I didn't have a ton of stuff by Jimmy Guffrey or Lee Konitz. I do. Since, since then, I've bought several things by each one of them. Um... And I was familiar with their playing as side men, uh, but I'm not real knowledgeable on them. I knew who they were. I kind of knew their time period and their style. But um, just finding those little, those three little duets for just horns are, is just fantastic. And actually, this album is up on YouTube in full, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's called Guffrey, Konitz, Connors, and Blay, the IAI Festival in San Francisco, all recorded live in one day. It's a shame that it's only 36 minutes long and um, no other additional material ever came out from it. Now the thing that made me actually decide to do this kind of uh, festival theme is the new CD that I just picked up recently. Uh, as I mentioned, I've in, in the warmer weather in the summertime, I've become um, quite enamored with a lot of acoustic music and classical music recently and and I've been putting a lot of the electronic stuff that I normally listen to to the side and of course going into jazz I've been listening to a lot of Bill Evans pianist Bill Evans music and especially one of the things that I've been listening to a lot of are the several albums that he recorded in duet with um, bassist Eddie Gomez just piano and upright bass no drums and uh, you know very intimate and without the drums they're really propelling things it, it, it kind of occupies a different space and I saw this album which which is another festival this was on the Angel label and it is uh, a jazz what I thought was um, several tracks taken from a specific jazz festival made one year it's called live at the festival and I love that cover you know, even though I don't like the beach and I don't like the summertime, I love that imagery. Now, I don't know if that little tent or whatever that building is is supposed to represent uh, one of the places where the jazz bands played. I'd probably not. I don't think so. And this is not the original cover. Uh, this was the cover when they put this out on CD. But this was an album that originally came out in 73. Now, I thought this was four tracks taken from four different bands uh, that goes back to the LP era. The LP originally came out in about 1973, late 1973 or 74. When they finally put it on um, compact disc, they did not add any additional tracks, unfortunately. So what you have is just the original 49-minute uh, album as it appeared on vinyl. Uh, and then looking at it, it's, a, it's all taken from the same jazz festival in Yugoslavia. Festival Ljubljana, it looks like, Ljubljana in Yugoslavia. But uh, instead of it being from one particular festival one year, it's actually taken from three different years. 1970, 1972, and 1973. So apparently they have this annual jazz festival and they record it and for some reason they did this, this is a real compilation instead of just choosing four tracks from four bands uh, from one of the years they got three different years representative here represented here um, two different um, things from 1973 one from 1970 and one from 1972 and again it's only 49 minutes but I bought this because of um, this 15 minute version of Miles Davis's Nardis by Bill Evans. Now this is a track, Nardis is a well-known track that everybody's recorded. Most of the time it's recorded because it was originally written and performed by Miles Davis um, quintet. Most of the time the people that covered it um, feature horn players because you know you had Miles Davis on trumpet, John Coltrane on sax I guess when he originally recorded this track. Um, and so over the years, this became a popular track for jazz musicians to, to cover, and but especially those with horns. And yet, I'm pretty sure like guitarist Ralph Towner has played this solo. Uh, there's a lot of musicians that have picked up Nardis, and even Bill Evans himself 
played Nardis many times over the years. I don't know that you do. You really need another version of Nardis. The interesting difference here for me, uh, and this version is quite different. It's 15 minutes long, which is very long um, compared to some of the other versions that Bill's recorded. Um, and at the time, he had Eddie Gomez on bass. Now, Eddie Gomez was his longest lasting bass player that played with Bill. Eddie played with him for 11 years. And also for six out of those 11 years that Eddie Gomez played bass with Bill Evans, uh, Marty Morell was a drummer. So and that was his lo Bill's longest lasting lineup is Marty Morell uh, on drums, Eddie Gomez on bass, and Bill on piano. Um, that band lasted for six years. And uh, Marty Morell ended up leaving because he, he wanted to get out of the lifestyle of constantly touring and settle down into an area for more of a home life. Um, at this time, Marty Morell was still playing with Bill Evans, and yet he doesn't play drums on this track, which makes it quite interesting. So apparently Bill, at this time, this was a recording from 1972, um, Bill had this brief foreign tour where he was playing this uh, festival in Yugoslavia and I'm guessing some other dates and Marty Morell didn't go with him and instead uh, Bill had this is the only time he played with him I'm pretty sure the British drummer Tony Oxley played drums and you could tell it's different if you're familiar with the Bill Evans trio with Eddie Gomez and Marty Morell during that six year period that that band was together you get used to how they would improvise and their sound and everything and Tony Oxley just having that one guy in the band be different Tony Oxley as a drummer takes the improvisation that the the guys do on the Miles Davis track just into a completely different area it sounds very different than what you're used to hearing the Bill Evans trio at that period of time, late 60s, early 70s, do, just because you change the drummer. Tony Oxley's drum solo is completely different than the kind of thing Marty Morell would play. In fact, it ends up sounding like if Bill Evans had recorded for the ECM label, kind of. It's very interesting. And I read, because I've got a couple of biographies about Bill Evans, that Bill was very turned on to this, to what Tony Oxley brought, uh, to this very short tour that he did with the band, and he actually, he actually asked Tony Oxley to join the band. Um, but Tony Oxley declined simply because he was based in England, and he knew that most of the playing of the Bill Evans Trio was being done in America at that time, and it would mean that Tony would have to be spending or even living in America. So that's the reason that he actually turned down Bill Evans as his drummer. So it's quite interesting to hear, because if you just listen to this piece and weren't aware that it was Bill Evans, I don't think you would pick up it was Bill, because Tony Oxley brings it into such a different area. But again, just like you know, you, you hope you'll find, there's other tracks that are very interesting here as well. Uh, there's a track from 1973 by Archie Shepp, uh, who has a, a band together with a piano, bass, and, and two percussionists. Uh, a track called Sonny's Back. Now, if you're familiar with Ar Archie Shep, the saxophone player, he's kind of avant-garde. He's not like real free, free jazz, but he's kind of avant-garde. And it's very strange because this track, well, I'm guessing, references um, Sonny Rollins by the name, by the title of it, Sonny's Back, is the most straight-ahead jazz thing I've ever heard Archie Shep play. Straight, almost like a bebop thing. Very interesting. Um... There's an 18-minute track on here, which I guess is the centerpiece of the album, recorded in 1970 at the same Yugoslavian Jazz Festival. Um, very interesting track, 18 minutes long, by Bobby Hutcherson on Vibes, Bobby who just passed away a couple years ago, um, Harold Land on tenor sax. And if I think, I've heard Harold Land's name for ages. I think I only have Harold Land playing on maybe two or three albums as a sideman. Uh, Hal Galper on piano, uh, Reggie Johnson on bass, and Joe Chambers on drums. If you're a real jazz person, you actually know all of these guys. But this uh, band was essentially, I guess, Bobby Hutcherson's putting it together. Interesting lineup for Bobby Hutcherson to be playing with uh, Harold Land on tenor sax and Hal Galper on piano. Um, 
Really nice track. 18 minutes, so it's it's free. There's a lot of solo space. And the shortest track on the album, but just something that's very interesting and, and a couple people that I'm pretty familiar with, uh, a, a version of Round About Midnight. Uh, do you need another version of Round About Midnight? It's, I believe, the second most recorded jazz composition ever in terms of numbers. But it's quite a unique unusual version in that uh, it's done by Karen Krogh on vocals and singing lyrics to it I don't know who wrote the lyrics because Round About Midnight was a always an instrumental turns, tune so somebody along the way uh, wrote lyrics to it that Karen Krogh sings and she's accompanied only by Harold Anderson on bass so it's just bass and, and vocals so if you're going to hear a tune like Round About Midnight for the 300th time, um, you better do something different with it. And uh, this was a recording from 1973, very unusual. I didn't know Karen Krog and Harold Anderson had ever played together as a duo like that, uh, just upright bass and vocals. Quite, quite interesting. The fourth and last one, which I'm going to talk about for uh, four and a half hours, is something that, again, I've never even seen listed in Discogs. It's an album that I came across by accident. I thought I ordered it online at Tower Records. Tower Records used to have an online store. Um, and I may have, but it has the Tower sticker on, the, the price sticker. I used to always try to take these, these price stickers off. If I could get them off the cellophane and, and stick them onto the case just so I would remember where I bought it because uh, they always generally had embossed the store name on there, but also what I paid for it. So nine ninety nine at Tower. But I thought that when I ordered online that you didn't usually get CDs with the price stickers on. Like, they came out of the warehouse and not the store, but I could be wrong because I was pretty sure that I ordered this online. Um, I don't remember flipping through the racks of the Tower Records and seeing this blue jazz album. This is interesting, and it's not. It's on the B&W label, which was a, a, a European label, um, looks like it was based out of England. That was around for a few years. I want to say like the late 90s. And I have several albums recorded on this label, and they kind of came and went. Uh, I don't think they exist anymore. I'd be surprised if they do, because I haven't seen anything of theirs pop up lately. But this album, this particular album, was released in 92. Um, it's a jazz festival. It's a, the Montre uh, a live album from the Montreux Jazz Festival, which is held every year. It, it very frustratingly it doesn't say what year it was recorded um, anywhere that I can recall and I, I didn't pull out the notes to look at it actually to be honest with you but I don't recall it said yeah it doesn't say I'm guessing it probably was the 1990 or 91 um, yeah but the liner notes don't tell you and this is you know again this is now my book because it had um, one guy that I'm nuts about and a, a whole bunch of other musicians that I know a little bit about and some I don't know anything about. This is a real oddball album uh, because it's got two bands on here that are straight blues rock bands. Um, the Leon Thomas Band, and they sure as hell sound like they're from America, and one called Roy Rogers and the Delta Rhythm Kings. And they're both straight blues, vocal songs, you know, blues, electric blues, guitar. Not my thing at all. I would never buy an album with that um, on there. You know, and I've listened to it. You know, when I put on the album, I generally will listen to these tracks. For most people, they're skip over tracks. I can't believe anybody that would buy it for, the, for these bands, the blues rock bands, would in the least bit like the jazz stuff that's on here because it's pretty out there. I bought it because Christy Doran is on here. Christy Doran was a guy, a guitarist, born in 1949 in Ireland, though he grew up in, um, in Switzerland, which I believe he's been based in Switzerland his whole life. Um, he founded a band, I guess in the late 60s, called Om, O-M, and it was a jazz quartet. It's amongst my favorite things that he's ever done. And they lasted, I guess, until about the late 70s. I guess they broke up in the late 70s. Uh, it was a steady band with, the, I believe, the same lineup. I don't think there was any changes in the lineup of um, drums, um, bass, Christy Doran on guitar, and a saxophone player named Urs Lemongruber. Um, I think is how you pronounce it. Yes, Urs Lemongruber on saxophone. 
So sax, guitar, bass, and drums. Uh, they recorded for the Japo label for a number of years, uh, the precursor to ECM. And um, I don't think any of their albums actually came out on ECM until they had a compilation album come out on ECM a few years ago of their uh, selected tracks from their four or five albums that were recorded for uh, the Japo label. Um, that's just about my favorite thing that Christie's done. Christie has since gone on to make many, many solo albums. A lot of them are very rock and fusion oriented, not entirely my thing. Others are very avant-garde, which is my thing. He did a couple things that are all solo, just him on guitars, overdubbed, uh, which are pretty out there. Um, and he's done one album that I got about a year or so ago with just him and a Chinese uh, string instrument player. I think it's the pipa. Um, so just him on guitars and this Chinese, um, traditional Chinese stringed instrument, which is just a weird combination, which I enjoy very much. But I bought this for the one track that uh, Christy Dorn does on here. And it's just him solo, so he just goes out there with his various looping pedals and stuff and plays this kind of wild, this wild guitar thing. Interestingly, there's another track here by two guys uh, called Brennan and Lemon Gruber. And Brennan is a piano player, and Lemon Gruber, oddly enough, also a guy playing apparently the, the Montreux Jazz Festival the same year as Christy Doran, er, is Ursh Lemon Gruber, Christy Doran's former bandmate in the band Om, doing a saxophone and piano duet, which is a really good track. So that was kind of a bonus, because I didn't even notice that they were on here. And it's kind of weird that his ex-bandmate would be playing, um, Christy Doran's ex-bandmate would be playing the same festival as Christy Doran. Um, and there's also uh, three live tracks by Max Lasser's Ark. Max, L I don't know how you describe Max Lasser. I do have one or two albums by him. He's a guitarist. Uh, I, would you, I, I guess you would call him a cross between the more electric, electronic, commercial side of new age music, uh, like with a, I guess like a slight progressive rock bent to it. If you're aware of any of those new age artists that, you know, use drums and, you know, guitars and keyboards, all, all very electric, um, kind of had a, you know, a glossy sheen to them, um, nothing particularly screaming like wild guitar solos or anything, but certainly on the more commercial side of new age music, almost crossing over in, into a, into a progressive rock type of thing. Uh, so Max Lasser's Art does three live tracks on here, which is another real plus for me. Um, this is a real wild, interesting album called Blue Jazz. And when I tried to look it up on Discogs, there's actually no mention of it. Very strange. Uh, Discogs has some of the most obscure things on there. Um, so that's my six-hour video on um, some festival, multi-artist festival albums that I particularly like. Um, Actually, I love all of these. These are, these are things that, um, you know, three of them I've had for years. Uh, even the vinyl album of the Berlin Fest, long ago I copied over um, and I burned a, a CDR from it, from, from the vinyl. So And it's in my computer, so I still actually get to listen to that album uh, with all its wonderful clicks and pops. And um, this was the only new one that I've gotten recently. I just got in the last week or so. But... Um, the other three are just things that I've been listening to for years, listening to a lot, and uh, listening to recently. And I thought, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I've shown any of these, I could be wrong. So, uh, in an effort to maybe get to some of my, uh, my stuff that I haven't shown before versus showing the same albums over and over again, um, I was going to do a video on albums that I uh, long long ago, I've, I've had for many years, and long ago recorded like onto cassette, um, and or mp3 even to play in my car and drive around with, and um, you know, things that I've been listening to for like 20, 30 plus years, that I have the most associations with driving uh, to, and then I realized all of those albums that, you know, I've been listening to for that many years, in various permeations on cassette and, and, and CDR on, in cars and stuff like that are all albums that I've shown numerous times so it would be me showing some of the same albums over and over again and you know I like to do theme videos so 
I thought maybe the festival album thing is a little different, and especially because I do have a, a lot of other live albums recorded at festivals, but most of them focus on one specific group or one group of musicians, like uh, the Blue Montro thing. I was going to show that, but Blue Montro is mostly uh, just one group of musicians playing in various permeations, uh, Mike Maneri and Warren, Warren Bernhardt and all these people. So it's basically like one extended band just playing in different size groups. So I thought that didn't fit in here, you know, with this different, varied, multi-artist kind of thing. So, sorry for going on so long, um, but I wanted to make my presence known. And, uh, you know, I've got other things going on in my life and problems with the condo here and repairs being done here that I have to do and all this kind of crap. And I'd rather not think about it, so I came out here to make a video. Okay, guys, thanks for watching if you've watched. And, um, you know, I'll be back at some point when I'm back. Take care. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.